Powers 4. Crimson by Rob Harper. Belfast, Ireland. Crimson walks down the dark path towards the man she seeks. She is tall, red-headed, and lithe like a cat, ready to spring, but that isn't all she is. She is also a power. With psychic abilities rivaling her mother's, Crimson has become the best at what she does, and what she does is espionage. She was sent to this small country by a shadowed contact to follow a certain man. Who her contact is, who the man she is following is, and why she is following him isn't her business. She does her job without question, and never gets involved. The man she is following is, by day, a wealthy businessman, but at night, he is much shadier. So far, she has followed him to a bordello, where he stayed for half an hour, and now she is tailing him down a dark path behind some abandoned buildings. She doesn't fear the situation. She's been in much worse. Her psychic awareness keeps watch for any other people in the area, and finding none, she concentrates on her prey. The man stops behind one of the buildings, just out of crimson view, and begins to talk. Since she cannot detect anyone, she assumes he is using a cell phone, or some other type of communicator, so she inches around for a better view. As she slowly makes her way around to see her target, she is shocked to see another figure in the alley. The tall shape is conversing with her target. What the bloody hell? Where'd that guy come from? I can detect the guy I was following, but the other one's completely blank. It's like he's not even there. Maybe it's a hologram he's been talking to. An expensive and not usually useful way to converse. But maybe the tall figure likes for the people to see him. Crimson once again gets the shock as the figure hands her target an envelope. Not a hologram, but then why can't I read him? She tries as hard as she can to read the dark figure, but cannot. He is shielded somehow, and Crimson wants to know his trick. She hates to be caught unaware. Her target turns to leave and she ducks lower so as to avoid his gaze. She peeks up to see the dark figure start to dissolve out of thin air, and as it does, its eyes shine at evil red, and they seem to be looking at her. Crimson quickly leaves the scene of the weird exchange and soon picks up her target again. He jumps into a cab and heads into the center of the small town, and she jumps on her own motorcycle she's stashed nearby. With psychic powers, following someone is pretty easy, and she keeps a distance so as not to alarm her prey. The target goes back to the bordello he was at earlier. Hmm. Maybe he isn't going here for a little on the side. I bet this is where he's to deliver the envelope given to him by that weird guy. Crimson trails the man inside, hoping that women are allowed in the place. She is soon immersed in the decadence and deviance of the sexually perverse within, and is having a hard time following her target in all this chaos. She catches a glimpse of the target going into the back room, marked private, and she makes her way over to the door, trying not to throw up at some of the acts being performed all around her. She leans nonchalantly against the wall beside the door, and probes the mind of her target to see what's going on inside. Her target gives a man dressed all in black the envelope. She can't quite make out the man as he is in shadows. The man in shadows smiles. Excellent. He says it in the evil villain sort of way that Crimson has become accustomed to. Just as the man is about to say something else, someone comes up to Crimson. Hi babe, want to come spank me? I'll pay top dollar. Crimson's concentration is disrupted. In your dreams, perv. She psychically slaps the man, giving him a splitting headache, and no more desire to be spanked, and he stumbles away. Crimson reprobes her target's mind to see what is happening, only to see the man in black holding up a gun. Thank you for the delivery. The figure in black fires, killing Crimson's target. As his life fades, Crimson sees the man in black standing over the corpse, as another man wearing a uniform walks up beside him. Was that necessary? The man in black just shrugs, and the uniformed man walks away, while the man in black stares intently at the corpse. What do we have here? Crimson feels the man in black looking at her, and she breaks contact, and she runs out of their bordello into the dark, cold night. As she runs outside, she knows whom she had seen. The man in black was Night Day, of the Masters of Violence, and the uniformed man was judgmental. The rumor of his attack on Congo Night had reached her, but she never thought his hatred for the Infinity Court would go so far as to have him ally himself with the MOV. Damn. I hope Night Day couldn't tell where I am. Crimson rushed outside, but as she gained the door, she realized that her hopes were for naught. Waiting for her on the front lawn of the bordello is a squad of MOV guards. She doesn't have time to think before she finds that she is on the wrong end of rifles pointed at her. This wasn't the first time she'd been staring down the barrel of a gun, but usually she would be able to handle the guard with her psychic powers. This time she was severely outnumbered, though. Crimson had to do something quick. If Judgmental or Night Day got out here, she'd be out of luck. She couldn't take Judgmental and these guards, not to mention Night Day. This mission had just gone way beyond a simple stalking to the realm of world safety. She had to get to Professor Wildebeest, or even her dad Prometheus, to warn them about Judgmental in the MOV. She realized the armor the guards were wearing is similar to the Masters of Violence troop armor, but not quite the same. 
What did this all mean? She hated getting caught flat-footed. All this went through Crimson's mind in a flash. She quickly jumps into the fray before the guards can pull their triggers. The old familiar sigh effect blazes across her face as she stuns a few of the guards psychically, while heel-kicking and palm-thrusting two others. She spins into a roundhouse, taking out three more, leaving a single guard dazed by what he had just seen. Crimson smiles and kisses his stunned face, and he falls down unconscious with his brethren. Crimson is off and running, knowing that the weird MOV group, along with Judgmental, wouldn't be far behind. As she rounds a corner, she catches the psychic scent of a man chasing her on foot. It isn't Judgmental, or Night Day, but he is running like a beast. She tries to scan the man and sees her pursuer in her mind's eye. Wearing a tattered uniform and a trench coat, the pursuer is above her. Jumping from roof to roof, he's gaining quick. Then, as she watches psychically, she finds out what she's up against. Mid-jump, the man splits into two, then lands and splits again. As he runs, more identical wolf-like villains join him. It hits her who her attackers are. Bloody hell! It's the pack. Her contacts have a dossier on them, but she had never met them before. So what do we have, then? Judgmental, Night Day, MOV, like gods, and now a pack connection. This is big. Too big for me alone. As she runs, she throws a mental image to as many of the pack that she can, that the ledge they had just jumped to is five feet closer than it is. She hears a set of howls, as some of them fall a few stories. That should slow them down slightly. Crimson jumps onto her hidden motorcycle and zips away, trying to guess what the hell has just happened tonight. Then she remembers another detail. The shadowy man who gave her target the envelope, which he delivered, and he was killed for. It was overwhelming as Crimson tried to calm her breath so as not to crash her bike as she raced at top speed. Machine gun fire rattled off the pavement all around her. Crimson looks back in shock to see an old Russian hind helicopter getting into position for another attack run. Damn. I just hate helicopters. It's just not fair. Any power she had met who couldn't fly hated helicopters. She swore and tried to concentrate on the road and the pilot of the chopper at the same time. She nearly careens into a lamppost avoiding the next salvo of machine gun fire, and then nearly drives over a bridge. Up from the other side of the bridge rises another helicopter. What's worse than one helicopter on your ass? Two helicopters on your ass? There's a construction site ahead. Well, this is the stupidest thing you've ever attempted, girl. But then again, I was trained by the best at what he does, and Uncle Wolf wouldn't think twice about doing this. She revs her bike and heads towards a conveniently placed plank. She hits the plank at full speed and jettisons up and off the bridge directly at the second chopper. Her actions must be as mind-boggling to the pilots of both helicopters as they are to her because all firing ceases and everyone just looks on in a stunned silence. At first she doesn't think she has enough speed to clear the helicopter's blades, and in a way she is right. The bike is too heavy, and starts to head for the deadly blades. She decides it's time to bail off her escape vehicle. She jumps up on the seat, and with one last thrust flips over the helicopter's blades. The bike hits them, and is shredded. Shrapnel flies in every direction, and once again luck saves her from taking any major hits. She probably would have hit the blades still, if the helicopter hadn't been critically wounded by the bike and started to fall. She twists and rolls into a dive position as a helicopter careens into the bridge and explodes. The heat singes her as she dives, just out of the explosive range, into the cold water below, like a cliff diver. If a cliff diver had to avoid falling helicopter as they dove into their water. The black water embraces her, and not for the first time that night, she thinks she has died. Her last thoughts are of getting to the beta, and telling them that one of the oldest teams of evil powers is teaming up with one of the newest. Crimson is awakened as she washes up on a pillar under a dock. She hears sirens, and slowly turns to see the bridge not that far away on fire with fuel and wreckage of a downed helicopter. She sees the other chopper scanning the water with a search beam, but nowhere near where she is. Their search seems half-hearted. They probably think no one could have survived that stunt. Kona wouldn't be proud. She tries to keep enough consciousness to pull herself over to a boat ladder nearby, and somehow she does. Her whole body aches, but all she can think of is the airport. She climbs the ladder and hails a nearby black cab. What the hell happened to you, dear? I went for a swim. Crimson slumps back, hoping that tonight will just end. Airport, please. The cabbie just nods. He knows when to mind his own business and heads for the airport. Once at the airport, she buys a plane ticket and then heads to a tourist shop. She comes out with some new clothes and ends up looking like a bruised leprechaun with all the Irish gear she has to buy. A few hours later, Crimson is safely in the air and is slowly returning to her old self. Just before she drifts off into a somewhat peaceful sleep, she tries to organize her thoughts for the coming days. It was about time I went back to the Foundation anyway. She falls asleep and dreams of her nice soft bed and the truth. To be continued. So, Jack. Jack. Yes, Rob. If I was going to uh, support a local audio podcast, 
who I loved because the people are just so damn personable. So how would I go about supporting such a uh, small podcast? I would think, and I'm no expert, I would think that you'd want to purchase uh, apparel, um, knickknacks, accoutrements, <laughs> that have the, uh, have the logo emblazoned on the front. I don't know where you'd find such things. Do you happen to know where I'd be able to uh, purchase that kind of uh, that, that that kind of production. Well, there is a place. It's a magical place. It's called cafepress.com slash Vinland Old Time Radio, and it's got accoutrements. That uh, the name it, it sounds trustworthy right off the bat. I would say uh, right off you know the top of my head, I'd say that their their products are, are of good quality. They are quite good quality. I would say that the the looks are of a fine f- fine nature. They are a fine fine nature. And I think I might just have to purchase something. Where would those proceeds go to? And uh, why would I want to support those people? Well, I know the proceeds would definitely go to the purchase of alcohol, because we are drunks, and we have habits to uh, maintain. At least it's not drugs. At the very least, it's not drugs. It might be hookers, but it's not drugs. And the hookers might be on drugs. But technically, we're not buying drugs. Is it? Te- well, we are buying hookers with drugs in their systems, so maybe technically we are buying drugs, but only, you know, third hand. It's called cafepress.com slash Vinland Old Time Radio. 